I'd like to welcome everybody to our Good Friday communion service, and I am really excited about our, our time together tonight. You know, a lot of times communion or the Lord's Supper is kind of towards the end of the worship service, and people are kind of thinking about the next thing, and we don't really stop and, and really think about what the Lord's Supper and communion is really all about. But that's going to be different tonight because that's going to be the, the centerpiece of our time together. And we're going to be able to just kind of really stop and think and meditate and contemplate what the bread means and what the cup means and, and spend that time really, really worshiping God as we meditate on the significance of the Lord's Supper. So why don't we begin with a, with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Good Friday. And Father, we realize that that Friday was not good for your son. Father, we know that that Friday, he experienced more pain and more agony and more suffering than we will ever possibly be able to comprehend. But Father, because of your love, because of your grace, you used that Friday to, to pay for every one of our sins. And so for that reason, Father, it is a good Friday. And so Father, we pray that as we come together tonight that your spirit might powerfully work in us through the music and through the message and through the elements, Lord, that, that we can be powerfully reminded and impacted by the fact that you loved us so much that you're willing to send your own son Jesus to this world to die a bloody death on the cross so that all of our sins could be forgiven. So, Father, we ask for your presence to be here with us tonight. Soften our hearts. Lord, help us not to be distracted by any other thoughts or the different problems and challenges that are out there in the world. But, Lord, help us to think and concentrate solely on you and on your son as he hung on that cross. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we just lift up our hearts in worship, as we sing of the love of Jesus, which is the reason why we celebrate this time. encourage you to spend time just um, praying tonight um, as we go through worship singing praises to him worshiping but also praying a prayer of thanksgiving or maybe there's maybe there's things that that have been hindering us from fully worshiping God why not let's get these things straight with him tonight before we even begin before we even start so that we can fully let our hearts worship him tonight is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his winds and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. And oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. Oh, how your father loves. Sing it again. He is jealous. He is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath. The weight of his winds and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, We 
are his portion. We are his portion. He is our prize. We're drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven meets earth like a poured out on each and every one of us here, Lord. So, Father, right now, we just lift up our hearts in praise and adoration of all that you are, Lord, and ask that you would move in power and in might here this evening. Lord, that every eye would be looking to you, Lord. Lord, that every heart would be turned to you. Lord, that we would turn our, our, our affections, our wants, our needs, our desires, everything to you tonight. 
for you alone are worthy. So Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We praise you. And ask that you continue to move. And we pray all this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Oh God, how thankful we are of your great love. Father, we are not worthy of it. But Father, we are so thankful that we've received it. Father, I pray that uh, you would open our hearts to the message that you have for us tonight. God, that we would become more overwhelmed by the great love that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I want to take us back first to the night that Jesus was betrayed. The night that he celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And I'll be reading a few verses from chapters 24 to chapters 27 to give us a fuller picture, some background of what happened as Jesus approached the cross. This background happened a couple days before the Last Supper. Jesus had just finished teaching his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and that teaching is known as the Olivet Discourse. This was Jesus' last major teaching before the Lord's Supper. What was Jesus speaking about? Look at Matthew 24, verse 3. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Notice the question speaks of a future time when Jesus will come back. Jesus had been previously speaking to his disciples about him leaving and coming back one day. Now in verse 3, they want to know when will that be and what will be the signs to let them know beforehand so that they can be ready. You see, in order for Jesus to come back, he had to go somewhere. He had to leave earth. And the cross was imminent at this point in the narrative. Good Friday was coming. However, in chapters 24 and 25 in the book of Matthew, Jesus doesn't answer the question when he will come back. He basically tells them to be ready, that the time will be unexpected. And we see this in verse 44 of chapter 24. For this reason you be ready too, he says to the disciples. For the Son of Man, the Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. He mentions that title about 80 times in the four Gospels. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Look also at verse 13 of chapter 25. He tells his disciples again, Be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. You see, Jesus' message to his disciples is the same message that he has for us, that he's coming back and we need to be ready. You see, this begs us to ask ourselves a question. Are you ready for Jesus to come back? You see, you can only answer that question in the affirmative with a yes if you have dealt with what Jesus did on the cross for you and your sins. You see, not only did Jesus discuss the topic of him coming back in 24 and 25, but he also talked about judgment. Look with me at verse 34 of chapter 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, he calls these people sheep, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. But only a few verses later, verse 41, then he will also say those to the left, he calls these people's goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, this whole section, even though 
It was talking about a distant future when Jesus would come back. It was all centered around a near future, the cross. You see, it was pointing toward the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to be a sheep? Or are you going to be a goat? Are you going to be on the right? Or are you going to be on the left? Skip down to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 26. And it came about when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man, Jesus himself, is going to be delivered up for crucifixion. We need to remember that the Lord's Supper has its foundation. It has its roots in the Passover meal. However, we will talk more about that in just a moment. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 26, the Jewish leaders come into the context. And they set God's eternal plan into motion. They plan to take Jesus, to arrest him, and kill him. But they say, not now, but just in a few days after the festival. But this wasn't a surprise to God. From the before the foundation of the world, God knew that he would have to send his son to die on that first Good Friday. And Mary, the sister of Martha, comes into the narrative in verse 7 of chapter 26. And she pours expensive perfume on Jesus' head as he's reclining on the dinner table. And Jesus explains in verse 12 why why she did that. For when she poured this perfume upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. The cross is coming. Again, this is not a surprise to Jesus. He became the God-man for the purpose of that first Good Friday. And starting in verse 14, Judas goes to the Jewish leaders, and he agrees to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And verse 16 says, And from then on, Judas began looking for a good opportunity to betray him. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together one by one. The cross is just around the corner. The disciples ask Jesus, where would you like for us to celebrate the Passover? And Jesus directs them, and in verse 19 it says, and the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. You see, this is the Lord's Supper, the very last meal that Jesus will have with his disciples before the cross. And we will all share in the Lord's Supper in just a few minutes. The Lord's Supper, our communion, has its foundation all the way back in Exodus chapter 12 with the institution of the Passover. Do you remember that background? It's the tenth plague, the final plague against Pharaoh and the rest of the Egyptians. Remember, God sent Moses from Midian to Egypt to get his people Israel out of slavery. That was about 1,500 years before the Lord's Supper. And God told Pharaoh through Moses several times, let my people go. But Pharaoh kept saying, no, no, no. And God decides in the tenth and final plague that he is going to kill every firstborn male of every family in Egypt. But he's going to give Israel a way to escape. He's going to give Israel a way to freedom. The people of Israel had to take a one-year-old male lamb that was unblemished, and they had to kill it, and they had to take the blood of that lamb and put it around the doorposts of their house. Then the angel of the Lord would pass over their house and not kill their firstborn if and only if the blood of an unblemished lamb was above their doorposts. And that's why it's called the Passover, because the angel of the Lord passed over the houses of Israel. You see, if the Israelites didn't have the blood of an unblemished lamb over their doorposts, the angel of the Lord would strike the firstborn down. However, if they had the blood of an unblemished lamb over their doorposts, the angel of the Lord would pass over, and they would be safe they would be set free. You see, when this finally happened, Pharaoh said, go! They were released from their bondage. The Israelites were redeemed. 
they were set free from Egyptian slavery by the blood of an unblemished lamb over their doorposts. And Jesus uses the story of the Passover to institute a new tradition. Just as the Israelites were redeemed from Egyptian slavery by a blood of the unblemished lamb from their doorpost of their house, you and I can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ crucified on the cross for us. Jesus was the Lamb of God from heaven who took away the sins of the world. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are released from our slavery, our slavery of sin and our slavery of death. You see, the Lord's Supper is about the true Lamb of God. Jesus Christ killed for us and killed because of us. And the question that you have to answer in your heart and the question that I have to answer in my heart, have you been redeemed? Have your sins been forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ crucified on the cross? Let me ask that question again, and I would like for you to answer it out loud. Have you been redeemed? Have your sins been forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, has there been a point in your life when you have trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone to set you free from the slavery of sin and death? Back to the text. Jesus was arrested at the end of chapter 26, and we pick up the story the next morning in chapter 27, verse 28. And they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and we need to remember who the him is. He is the very Son of God, the creator of the universe. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on Jesus' head, and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt before him and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him. And they took a reed and they began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took off his robe and they put his garments on. And they led him away to crucify him. You see, the reason why Jesus was spat on, the reason why Jesus was mocked, the reason why Jesus was beaten, the reason why Jesus was nailed to a cross was because sin had to be dealt with. Sin had to be paid for. Sin had to be punished. So the reason that we share in the Lord's Supper or communion is so we can remember what Jesus Christ did for us. He was the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God. This was a very significant point in history. This event signified that people would no longer have to look in expectation and hope to the coming Messiah. But now that they can look back and see what the Messiah did for them on the cross. The Messiah had come. He had suffered death for us. And he had dealt once and for all with the problem of sin. And back in chapter 26, verse 26, it says... And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this. This is my body. And in the parallel passage in Luke chapter 11, I mean chapter 22, verse 19, Luke mentions the entire statement of Jesus at this point. This is my body. And listen to this part, which is given for you and for you. And for you, and for you. Do this, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. You see, this piece of bread that we're going to be eating in a few minutes is a symbol of Jesus' body broken for us. It symbolizes that Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Would the ushers please come up? You know, the prophet Isaiah would prophesy around 700 years before about Jesus. 
And he said, but he, Jesus, was pierced through. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ this evening, you are more than welcome to celebrate communion with us. Ushers, can you please pass out the bread? And as you receive the bread, please have a time of prayer and remember what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross. that piece of bread between your thumb and your pointer finger and would you crush it that bread represents Jesus being crushed for our iniquities Matthew 26 Verses 27 and 28 says, And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the author of Hebrews says, And according to the law, one may also say that all things are cleansed without, with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Did you hear that, church family? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You see, the juice that we're about to drink is a symbol of Jesus Christ's blood shed or poured out for us. And a covenant in the Bible is an agreement between two parties. And in the Bible, covenants are always ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. If Jesus didn't shed his blood, if he wouldn't die, there would be no forgiveness of sins through him. We would still be in our sins. And in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51, 
And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. As you are aware, the high priest could only go in the Holy of Holies one time a year, one time a year behind that curtain to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people of Israel for that year. But because of the blood of Jesus, if we come to faith in him and him alone, God's spirit comes and dwells within us. And that is the promise of the new covenant, that there is no veil any longer. But we have free access to God because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Ushers, would you please pass out the juice? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Juice is a symbol of Christ's blood shed for you. You know, Paul tells us a little bit more about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
You see, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper like we have done tonight, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Do you remember what the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25? When are you coming back? Jesus' answer, it's not for you to know. Just be ready. How can we know that Jesus will come back? Because what happened on Sunday? Sunday is coming. Let's finish this service by singing a couple songs, thanking him for what Jesus did for us. Let's stand and worship him.
continue to worship. Oh, 
Father, Lord, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for the time that we had in your presence this evening, Lord. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that we can walk out of this building tonight and keep our minds, hearts, and spirits focused on you, Lord. Lord, that in everything we do, every step that we take, every move we make, every word that comes out of our mouth, Lord, that they would be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, let us live lives of worship every second of every day, Lord. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. It's all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.